Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Kyle Shelton, the Deputy Director of the Kinder Institute for Urban Research. I want to welcome you all today uh, for our Urban Read series. This is where the Institute uh, showcases recently published books by regional and national authors and uh, books that we think will be of great interest to our, our stakeholders and all of you here in Houston and our region. Uh, Centerpoint is the title sponsor of our lecture series, Urban Reads, um, and we have we are always thankful for their support. Uh, in addition to Centerpoint, I also want to acknowledge the support of the Houston Endowment and a number of other uh, longtime supporters, especially Nancy and Rich Kinder and the Kinder Foundation, Laura and Tom Bacon, the Baxter Trust, Chevron, J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation, Wells Fargo, the Cullen Trust Foundation, Raynette and Stan Merrick, PNC Bank, Claire and Eric Anya, Catherine and Hank Coleman, Sis and Hasty Johnson, Becky and Ralph O'Connor, Bank of America, Bracewell, HEB, and the United Way of Greater Houston. All of those supporters make our, our work possible and make um, these types of great events possible. So we're really appreciative of all their support. Um, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Andrew Smith, our speaker today. She's the founder of 3MPH um, Planning and Consulting. She was a longtime writer uh, and national editor for Streets Blog and is one of our country's best known writers and experts on uh, sustainable transportation and, and roadway safety for all users. Um, you may have seen her writing in addition to Streets Blog in the New York Times, the Atlantic and Bicycling and Landscape Architecture Magazine. And of course, we're here today to talk about her recent book, Right of Way. Oh, see, that's why the background doesn't work, Angie. We were talking about that at the beginning. Um, which is just a, a great read and uh, is a really important read uh, when, as we're thinking through, uh, as she calls it, the silent e epidemic of pedestrian deaths in America. Um, and it's certainly a challenge that we struggle with here in Houston and the Houston region. And uh, we're very uh, lucky to have you with us today and appreciative of your time. So with that, Angie, I'll ask you to take it away. And thanks for joining us. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really exciting to be speaking in Texas. Like Kyle mentioned, um, one of the areas with uh, one of the worst problems related to this. So, um, sorry, I'm gonna go get this PowerPoint started. Always a little bit awkward, but yeah, my book is called Right of Way. And when I do my little elevator pitch about this book, I say it's about the pedestrian safety crisis in the United States. So in this presentation, I'm just gonna explain what I mean by that. Uh, who's getting killed, what, where, and um, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about cars and what we can do about it. So, uh, shoot, this actually isn't the right presentation. <laughs> I'm sorry, let me pull up the other one. Sorry, you guys. Wrong presentation. Okay, I'm gonna share again. Okay, sorry, I'm doing a lot of these presentations. So, okay, getting into it, this, some of the history. Um, this is what I'm talking about when I say the, the pedestrian safety crisis in the United States. Um, in about the past 10 years, we've had about a 50% increase in pedestrian deaths. So um, this is really unusual in traffic safety. Uh, usually uh, since about the 1970s, we've seen grad mostly gradual increases in, in um, safety, traffic safety of all kinds. So for all users, you know, because since we've int introduced things like seatbelts and airbags, you know, we've just seen sort of a gradual steady progress. So when this, when this trend started happening, and we've seen the same kind of trend to a lesser extent with bicyclists, um, a lot of people who were traffic safety experts were, uh, a little bit surprised, didn't really know what to make of it, um, or even thought it was an anomaly. But now we know that it is a um, it's a it's a continuous trend. So um, we've gotten to the point in the United States. I just use this illustration as an example where pedestrians have become very marginalized, and um, I think you know a lot of you that do any walking in Texas probably understand this sort of feeling. So um, 
like I mentioned, I want to talk about a little bit first about who is being killed. And I think, you know, there's been a little bit, some of the media coverage of this has been a little bit harmful. I know that there are some reporters down there in Houston doing some great work on this subject, but um, we often see this trope sort of brought up when, when this is discussed about who's being killed. And there's this idea that, um, you know, distracted pedestrians maybe are the problem. And I think this is a sort of the stereotype, this guy here on the left is sort of the stereotype in a lot of people's minds of who's getting killed. And he's like a very wired millennial and he's maybe crossing the street at a crosswalk in a major city like DC. Um, but really the, the type of people who are being killed are more like this guy over here on the right, who's just sort of um, sprinting across a very wide suburban, arterial that doesn't even have a crosswalk. So I think like this this sort of stereotype or image in people's mind is informed a little bit by the privilege of the people who maybe are working in the media or in governments who are um, more likely to be the kind of person who's sitting behind the wheel and th this is their experience sort of anecdotally of the problem and they're, they're not put in the situation of sort of this guy here on the right um, who may be lower income. So a little bit more about who is being killed. Um, this is an issue a little bit like Corona, where you would think everyone would be impacted by it kind of equally, just based on what we know about it. But it, again, like Corona, when we start digging into the data, it becomes apparent that a lot of the issues with inequality and racism we have in our culture sort of show up in this data. And so this is similar where Black people are at increased risk to be killed this way, almost twice as likely Hispanic folks, and then Native people ha have extremely high risk or almost five times as likely to be killed while walking. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about why that is later in the presentation. Um, but other, other groups who are marginalized, uh, again, are also at increased risk. And one of those groups is older adults. Um, I think this is, in, in planning, there hasn't been enough focus sort of on the aging of the American population, but we, we've known for a long time that older people are, are vulnerable to being hit and killed while walking. And I think some of the reasons are, you know, fairly obvious. Older people might be a little slower moving, a little uh, frailer. Um, if they are struck, it's more difficult for them to recover. Um, but just, again, this is a Smart Growth America chart, but it shows, you know, the risk starts rising for people when they're as young as 50. And then by the time they're 75, they're twice as likely to be killed while walking. So um, another thing I want to point out about this is this is a very fast growing um, demographic in the United States. We're to the point where about almost a quarter of Americans are 65 and older, and that is going to grow to about a third in the coming decades, it's expected. Um, so as far back as about 10 years ago, groups like the um, Center for Disease Control actually predicted that pedestrian deaths would rise due to the aging of the American population. Okay, so that's a little bit about who is being killed. Now I want to sort of switch gears and talk about where. Um, this, again, this is Smart Growth America, Transportation for America, a map they produce, and it shows the safest states, according to their analysis for walking, are these states in green. And the most dangerous are these purple states down here, mostly at the bottom. Um, so does anyone, I don't know if you guys are able to unmute yourself, but in or um, respond in the chat, but does anyone want to guess um, sort of why these purple states would be more dangerous or these green states would be safer? Folks should be able to drop that answer into either the, probably the chat, if you could do that, because then we can keep the Q&A cleared for the end. I'm actually not able to see the chat, I don't think. Are you able to, are we getting responses? Oh, I can see the Q&A. Okay. I may be wrong about the chat. If folks want to put it in the Q&A, I can clear the q and I can see the Q&A. So yeah, I hear, I see some stuff coming up. So one of the, one of them is sort of a lack of mass transit, which I think is along the right lines. Um, so the, the reason is, the reason I point to in my book is, um, 
some of these places, um, like, you know, one of the safest states is Massachusetts, um, where Boston is a major city. Boston is a very old city. Places like Boston, places like Cleveland, where I'm from, were mature cities. In fact, Cleveland was a larger city, sort of in the pre-auto era in the United States. So that's prior to around 1940, when um, cars became the primary mode of transportation in the United States. Um, so these places, older cities, you know, had a chance to develop in a more pedestrian friendly sort of way, pattern based on in Cleveland, we even have suburbs that developed along streetcars. I know that there are some communities in Texas that still retain that sort of form. But for the most part, these places in the Southeast in the Sun Belt region of the United States, their population boom was later. It was after the invention of air conditioning. And so they have a built environment that is, um, was constructed during the height of the auto era in the United States in a lot of cases. Places like Florida, which is Florida's the most dangerous state according to Transportation for America, it only had about a million residents in 1940 and now there's about 20 million people living there. So all the um, neighborhoods and the shopping centers and the arterials tend to be pretty car centric down there. So that is one of the reasons why the Southeast tends to be really deadly for pedestrians. Another thing I wanted to point out about this, again, um, I think this story about rising pedestrian deaths is a little bit about some wider demographic trends that are happening in the United States that just happen to be bad news for pedestrian safety. And one of them is this ongoing um, migration to the Sun Belt in the United States. Like these purple states that are the most dangerous, with the exception of Delaware, are almost without exception the most, uh, the fastest growing states in the United States. So a lot of population growth in exactly like Houston, the kind of cities that have the worst outcome for pedestrians. Okay, um, there's also some demographic trends happening within metro areas that are relevant to this discussion. So I'm using Cleveland as an example here where I live, but I just want to point out that these are the kind of trends we see across the United States. And in, in a lot of places that have faster population growth would be even more pronounced. But I just wanna point out here, this is a map and it shows racial segregation in Cleveland. Um, so uh, black people, concentrations of black people um, in green, white people, um, homogenous white communities in orange, and then the yellow areas show places that are a little more um, integrated. So um, this, is, this is 1990. If we go ahead two decades, we can sort of see, we don't have the latest census data. And if we did, I would expect this pattern to be a lot more pronounced. So, but still I think it's instructive while we're rating on that to sort of look. And obviously Cleveland is still very segregated, but um, a lot of our suburban areas have become a lot more diverse. And again, that's a, that's a national trend and, and is more pronounced in places like Atlanta that have seen a lot of population growth. So I, I think you know, another factor we have um, geographic migration to the Sun Belt, which again is a dangerous area. We also have this migration going on um, to our suburban areas, more people of color and also more lower income folks are living in the suburbs now. We've had this phenomenon that I'm sure a lot of you have heard of that's called sort of the suburbanization of poverty, which I think is, even though it's, it is discussed a little bit, uh, I think it's still sort of underappreciated what a big demographic change this is. So um, basically what that means is a lot of suburban areas that were designed again, sort of at the height of the auto era, um, later than sort of our streetcar suburbs and that kind of thing in Cleveland, places that were designed, you know, with the assumption that everyone would have two cars and a two car garage um, are now places where more low income people are living or more demographic groups that are less likely to have a car. So that puts more people at risk as well. Okay, so earlier I mentioned that people of color, black and Hispanic people, native people are more likely to be struck, to be killed this way, to be injured or killed while walking. And, it, and it, it's related to inequality and um, systemic racism. So here again, using Cleveland as an example, this is a map of our most dangerous road segments. And you can see how sort of 
closely they align with uh, racial segregation in Cleveland with um, neighborhoods of color. So um, again, that is something that's very common across metro areas. Um, one, one, one aspect of that problem is that more people of color, more black and Hispanic folks um, are because of the wealth gap and historic and continuing segre or, um, discrimination may lack access to a car. So they may be doing more walking in the first place, but also there's a level of discrimination that takes place at the city level where um, wealthier neighborhoods are better able to secure uh, needed safety infrastructure. And a lot of times on the flip side, um, black and brown neighborhoods, instead of safety infrastructure, get very harsh enforcement that tends to be racially biased um, when it comes to this problem. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna, uh, just to talk about this a little bit more, um, another example I like to use is Portland. And Portland is a city, you know, we all think of, I think, as pretty uh, forward thinking about bike infrastructure at least, um, but we see the same kind of patterns in Portland and it, you know, it might be worse than some other cities. So just as an example, here's a map they, they produced, the Portland Bureau of Transportation. Um, it shows all the traffic deaths they had over a two year period, 2017 and 2018. And they use the names of the victims in this map, which I think is a really nice touch to try and humanize the problem. But as you can see, they're not sort of happening in a random pattern. There's a clear concentration over here on the right side of the map. So I'm going to talk about what's going on there. Again, this is a map produced by the Portland Bureau of Transportation. And for people who aren't familiar with Portland, in Portland, there's a big demographic fault line right here at East 82nd Street. So everything east of 82nd Street in Portland is called East Portland. And the important thing to know about East Portland is just that it's um, more diverse and lower income than the rest of the city. So in Portland, 50% of traffic deaths are in East Portland, even though only about 25% of the city's population lives there. So people who live there are twice as likely to be killed um, in traffic. And uh, they use this map to... Um, single out the 30 highest crash intersections, 28 of 30 are in East Portland. So again, there's a, you know, some of this inequality that's happening in our society between our neighborhoods um, really comes through in the quality of the infrastructure and has really, really bad outcomes for um, low income and neighborhoods of color. Okay, so that was a little bit about, I talked about who is getting killed and where. And so just to reiterate a little bit before we move on to the big cars section. Um, the American population is getting a little bit older. So is a little bit more vulnerable to being hurt or killed while walking for that reason. In addition, we have more folks living in areas that are pretty hostile for walking. We have more folks in the Southeast portion of the United States and we have more folks who are lower income or may lack a car living in suburban areas that, again, can be really hostile. And in part, the, um, in, in cities that have had a lot of gentrification, that, that also contributes to sort of the suburbanization of poverty and the risk certain people are at. Um, so moving along, we have this other, we have this other thing that's happened in our, our society, this other trend, it's a consumer trend that's played a big role. And that is we've had a big change in our vehicle mix in the United States. So um, this, is, this is a graph from Bloomberg and it shows the vehicle mix, new cars sold in the United States. So if we look back to 2010, or when we're coming out of the last recession, most of the new cars being sold in the United States were sedans. And I, I'm, I'm guessing you guys know what I mean by sedans. I'm talking about like a, a Honda Civic or um, a Toyota Corolla, um, regular cars. But um, over the last decade, we had this very, very rapid shift. And now um, cars have sort of gone out of style, regular sedans. There's been this enormous growth in SUVs, especially crossover SUVs and um, a little bit of, of some growth in pickups too. So now, um, for the 2020 model year, 
it was effectively reversed. And about three and four new cars sold in the United States were pickup trucks or SUVs. So that, in addition, has a big impact on pedestrian safety. I'm going to talk a little bit about why. I'm using myself here for scale. So just for reference, I'm about I'm I'm five six. I'm a, a normal to tall size woman. So you can see over here on the left, um, if I was hit by a Honda Civic, it would hit me in the legs. And um, the, the, the physics in a crash like that, I would fall forward onto the front of the car, which is all bad. You don't want to get hit by a car in the legs. So leg injuries can be very serious as well. So a Civic is hitting me in the legs. Pretty straightforward. Uh, this is a Toyota 4Runner runner here on the right. It's going to hit me in the abdomen or the chest. So, you know, right where my internal organs are. That's a much more serious place to have a blunt force trauma um, for sort of obvious reasons. So there's a lot of data now. Um, it wasn't until around 2015, the Federal Highway Administration, they quietly put out this report saying, um, we, we've looked at a bunch of studies and determined that SUVs are two and a half to three times more likely to kill pedestrians when they strike them. And um, it's actually even worse for child pedestrians. They're, they, they can be as much as four times more likely to be killed if they're hit by um, an SUV. So meanwhile, while all this is happening, we also have um, pickup trucks becoming increasingly enormous. We see these same kind of trends a little bit, bigger cars, meaner front ends um, on SUVs as well. But it is most pronounced uh, with pickups. And I use this photo that I took, this is my son when he was four years old, standing in front of a lifted uh, Ford F-250. So um, you can see he would clearly be hit in the head if he was struck by a car like this and then pushed under where he would be run over, which is not, is not a good situation for a pedestrian. Um, another thing just real quickly to point out about this is a lot of these really big cars with this high grill height, which is in style now, um, have very large blind spots, both forward and um, rear blind spots. And there's a group called uh, kidsandcars.org that I reference in my book, but they, they've done studies where they've placed as many as like 30 kids sitting in front of vehicles like this, or even smaller vehicles. They've used full-size SUVs, like the um, Cadillac Escalade, and they're entirely invisible to the driver. Um, many of those cars have forward blind zones um, as much as 10 feet or 12 feet. And um, I just saw, it's interesting from consumer reports that a lot of best-selling pickup trucks have a rear blind zone that can be as long as 50 feet. So just some safety issues that come with these bigger cars. Okay, we're going, we're going way down this car rabbit hole. I think this stuff is really interesting, but um, I wanted to walk you through sort of the evolution of a single car. And this, I use the um, RAV4, the Toyota RAV4, because it's the best-selling car in the United States outside of pickup trucks. It was also the first crossover SUV, apparently. So um, this, is, this, is, this is a very early RAV4, 1996. And you can see how sort of cute and little it is. And um, so the RAV4 was based on the Toyota Corolla. At this point, this is a two-door version, the smaller one. It starts out at 2,500 pounds. And it, it's basically a little, uh, like a tall, slightly modified Toyota Corolla. Um, but as we go forward, and I think this happened a little bit slowly. So we become, it's almost a little bit invisible to us because it happened slow and then it happened fast. Um, but so you can see by 2009, it's added about 800 pounds on the light end. We have a bigger grill, sort of a meaner looking front end, much bigger car. And then if we just go forward, it actually hasn't added a lot of weight since then, but again, bigger grill, meaner front end. That styling trend is very big right now. And I think in some ways relates to some of the ugliness we've seen in our politics, sort of a splintering of society, People are having, wanting to have cars that look more violent 
And um, we've seen actually last summer cars and trucks being used for political violence um, a little bit more, which is disturbing, but I'm not gonna go too far into that. So anyway, shifting gears again, I wanna talk about, I know that's all very sad and a little bit of a bummer, but I wanna talk about some potential solutions before we wrap up. Um, so just to reiterate again, you know, I think that this pedestrian safety crisis, as I call it, is a result of a number of societal trends. And it, it has to do with demographic trends, um, you know, the aging of the population, a different migration trends. And it also has to do with this big consumer trend we've had towards larger, taller vehicles. Um, so now what, what can we do at the city level to sort of address this? I'm gonna highlight some good examples. And I wanna talk a little bit about New York. New York has um, tried harder than a lot of places to address these issues. They've had Vision Zero for a number of years. They, there's 9 million people living there. So they have, a, they have a pretty substantial, almost like a state size transportation budget to work with. So I think that's an advantage to New York. Um, but anyway, a Queens Boulevard uh, is an example. Um, it used to be called the Boulevard of Death in New York. And between 1996 and 2014, um, 189 people were killed on this road. And about 150 of them were pedestrians. So as many as 16 people a year are dying on this single road. And this is, this is an example of a suburban arterial, what we call in the planning industry, this is the most dangerous type of road. You guys have these all over Houston, I'm sure. So very, very wide in this case, high speed. And another risk factor, um, it, it tends to be more dangerous if there's a lot of um, destinations that people would want to access on foot, like retail, if there's a mix of retail, if there's a mix of housing, especially low-income housing, that can really help predict what are, what are the most dangerous roads. So, um, but anyway, this was a very dangerous road, but in 2014, in New York City decided to act, and they did... Um, a right sizing, I've heard. I don't want to use the term road diet because I've heard that that is um, not, uh, not appreciated in Texas. So <laughs> they right sized this road and they only spent about $4 million. And you can see they used really inexpensive materials here. They added, they, they took one of the travel lanes, the vehicle lanes, and they turned it into this one side's a sidewalk and this other side is a bike lane. And they just used paint and plastic bollards to do that. Um, I believe that they also added a transit lane, a bus only lane on the right side. So that was very effective for this street after, so they're going from having as many 60, as many as 16 deaths a year on this road. So after this project is, is completed, it goes down to zero. They have had, I should mention, so they go for several years, but with, with only having zero death, there have been a small handful. Of, there's been one, two, that kind of, um, occasionally there, there has been a death on this road since then, but there's been an enormous shift is the point. Another good example from New York um, and a tool that is very inexpensive and effective and should be in use more is this, um, this tool that's called pedestrian leading intervals. So what that means basically is New York is timing, retiming its traffic lights so that pedestrians get a few set seconds head start on turning vehicles with the walk signal. So there's a, a couple seconds where pedestrians get the walk signal and all the vehicles are stopped. And what that, what that does is it gives pedestrians a chance to be out sort of in the middle of the intersection um, when cars start making turns, especially left turns, which are really dangerous. And as you can see from this big yellow arrow here too, um, they also introduced this thing they're calling a center, a hardened center line. They basically just stuck something, you know, in the center line. And the point of that is um, it forces left turning vehicles to make a sharper, slower left turn instead of, you know, how sometimes they cut across those lanes and make a very wide, fast turn. So, um, Left turns are very dangerous, both for drivers and pedestrians, in part because drivers have those blind spots from the pillars between the windows and the windshield. So um, the combination of those two things, which 
again, is very inexpensive. It only costs New York about $1,200 per intersection to add these treatments. And they've added them at thousands of intersections across New York. So they say the combination of those two things has reduced pedestrian crashes about 40%. So that's very effective. Okay, I wanna talk, um, shift gears a little bit um, and talk a little bit about street lighting too, which is, is an important issue for pedestrian safety. Um, but before I do, does anyone wanna sort of guess what cities these are? Or does anyone know and wanna chime in? This is, um, this is obviously, uh, you know, it shows cities shot from space. So it's a satellite image of a couple cities. Yeah, someone, <laughs> David Chow knew right away that it was Detroit and he even got Toledo and Cleveland, right? So um, this is Detroit up here at the top for people who aren't aware. Um, this is Toledo, which we're not gonna talk about. And this is Cleveland where I live. So um, one thing I want you to notice about this picture is just that Detroit looks a lot bluer than Cleveland. Cleveland's more of an orange color down here at the bottom. Um, so this is a big success story. Um, so around 2011, 2012, Detroit does a big um, survey of its streetlights and it finds out that about 40% aren't working. They're broken, um, they're not functioning for whatever reason. So I think that streetlights has been a little bit of an underappreciated uh, urban amenity in planning. And I think it goes back again a little bit to to privilege, because I think a lot of us who are, you know, in more influential positions just can kind of expect that streetlights will function in our neighborhood, but that's not really the case for everyone. Um, so in Detroit, they have this situation, a lot of their streetlights aren't working it, but they did something about it again. Um, they issued $186 million in bonds and they fixed them all and they converted them to LED. So that's why it looks bluer in that picture. So these street lighting improvements take place bet between 2014 and 2016. And you can see these, this shows, this, um, this shows pedestrian fatalities in Detroit over time. They're one of the more dangerous cities in the North. You can see that as soon as those street lighting improvements are done. And even beforehand, they have this huge drop in pedestrian deaths. They declined about 35% in just two years. And that's against the backdrop of them rising nationally and elsewhere in Michigan. So um, that can be a really powerful tool and um, it's something that needs to be thought about from an equity perspective across neighborhoods. But final thing I wanted to point out about this um, graph. I know it's a little bit difficult to read, but this part at the top, this blue part, the important thing to know is deaths that occur in dark, unlighted conditions in Detroit. And you could see um, before this project gets started and in the early stages, they're having as many as 26 deaths a year that occur in dark, unlighted conditions. And as soon as this is completed, they go down, they almost disappear. They go down to having just one. This is another, I, it's funny because I use like Portland in this presentation as a bad example and Detroit is a good example a handful of times. But this is something I like that they're doing as a solution in Detroit, um, in part because it's so cheap. They're gonna install four, the, the goal anyway, is for them to install 4,500 speed humps in 2021. And it's only, it's gonna cost less than $12 million. So again, very an inexpensive way to control speed. Um, speed is a very important factor, uh, that's uh, probably the most important factor that determines whether pedestrians survive if they're struck by a car. It's also very important in, in determining whether drivers who strike things will survive. Similar, it's, it's, it's physics, um, similar type of thing. But you can see that the growth is not linear. Um, so if we're able to, especially for older folks, if we're able to reduce speeding or the speed cars are traveling just a few miles per hour, it can really be a life or death matter for people who are struck. And the places that have a lot have had a lot of success reducing um, traffic deaths, especially some of our European counterparts like Sweden, where they invented this vision zero concept, um, controlling speeds is, is really key. So this is, this is my last slide, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Um, I always use this one. Um, 
And I think like it shows, uh, it shows a, this is called a pedestrian refuge island. And I'm sure everyone has seen one of these before. It's not a very new or sexy treatment. Um, they're not very expensive to install either. They can be installed for um, as little as $1,500 or $2,000. Although this is um, an example of a little bit nicer one with landscaping, it probably costs more than that. And you can see it's nice and accessible. Um, another thing that I want to point out about this is it's sort of not controversial. Um, the Federal Highway Administration recommends these. They say they reduce pedestrian crashes about 35%. And it also um, doesn't really take away, in this case, doesn't take right away, away from drivers. So probably wouldn't be too politically controversial either. So um, well, the reason I bring that up is I, I think like, um, you know, we, we were very focused in planning sometimes on sort of design solutions, but um, we, we just really don't lack them for this. I think that that's really not the problem. The problem isn't that someone hasn't come up with a good enough design solution. I think it's really that the people in power sort of are not experiencing some of these really dangerous situations themselves in their in their day-to-day -day lives and so aren't very sympathetic to people who are or um, who do rely on that and then find themselves hurt or killed. Um, so part of what I'm trying to do with writing this book and going around and giving these talks is just sort of raise the profile of the issue because if we, we sort of, we don't lack the tools to resolve these issues. Although institutionally there are, are some obstacles to doing something like this, we, we sort of lack the will. That's the big problem. Um, so I just have a final slide. I think, you know, it's already been plugged, but if anyone does want to pick up the book, you can get a 20% discount through my publisher, Island Press, if you use my last name. I think it actually might be 25% now. I'm not 100% sure, but um, with that, I think we're gonna, I'll just stop slide sharing and I think we're gonna move into a Q&A period. Thanks, Angie. Really appreciate the presentation. Um, so again, if you do have questions, drop them in the Q and A. We have uh, folks doing that already, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask some as well. But um, Angie, the the top question right now is I think a good connection to your last slide about uh, the pedestrian uh, refuge and crosswalks generally. And I think uh, people are curious if in your sort of national review of of the laws around pedestrian safety and road users, um, crosswalks seem to kind of be treated differently in different states and you know whether you yield or not and and how we think about that across uh, different geographies um, and how people view them as a part of the infrastructure what have what have you encountered in in sort of best practices of of using crosswalks as a tool to keep folks safe so i think i'm a proponent of adding more crosswalks with the um qualification that a lot of times just painting stripes on the road is not enough. Um, drivers are really bad about yielding at crosswalks, uncontrolled crosswalks. So that means crosswalks without a traffic light. Um, but there's, there's additional tools, there's flashing lights. Again, I think the refuge islands are a really good idea to add um, that can make it safer. Uh, Hawk signals. So there, there's different sort of levels of protection or visual, um, notice we can provide with these and which one makes sense for the specific situation um, sort of depends on the local conditions. But um, one thing I discuss a lot in my book is the engineering profession uses a manual called the uh, Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And it it's like this guidebook that engineers all over the country use and it's supposed to determine, it's sort of, it's like the recipe book for streets in the United States. And the, it's sort of a holdover from the highway era in the United States. Their guidance about um, where to install crosswalks is terrible. Like they say, um, pretty much they say almost a hundred pedestrians have to be crossing at a specific location. This is a location without a crosswalk and a traffic signal. A hundred pedestrians per hour have to be crossing for a, a crosswalk to be warranted or five pedestrians have to be struck at that location in a single year for um, it to warrant a traffic light and slowing drivers down a little bit. So the good news is, I'm sorry, this is sort of long winded, but um, 
The good news is the MUTCD is being reviewed right now. It's um, It's got started under the Trump administration. They rewrote it and it's still pretty bad. So now it, it's not 100% official, but the ball's sort of in the Biden administration's court. Uh, Pete Buttigieg sort of has the power to make some pretty significant changes to it that could affect the way streets are designed all over the country. So I'm working with some groups that are trying to um, be active on that and try to demand that the, this manual, this engineering manual that's so important be revised to really stress safety and safety for vulnerable users. Whereas right now it's just sort of um, given engineers an excuse to not do anything about unsafe situations. And, and that's a great point. Somebody explicitly asked about the manual um, and, and advocating for changes around that. So is that both something folks can express locally and federally, it sounds like? Yeah, there's going to be opportunities for regular folks who are interested. Like, for, for example, uh, I could share a link. Um, you can comment right now to the federal government. It's open for comments. So you, I just, any, whoever can say, I, I feel like this revision is not sufficient. We need to prioritize safety, whatever. But also there's going to be some engagement from groups like um, I'm working with America Walks right now. I know they're going to be trying to rally people to comment and um, sort of raise awareness about the issue. That's sort of a live issue in it. An opportunity we have to really, some one of the few opportunities we have that could really have a big impact nationally. Great. Um, yeah, feel uh, if we can either share a link afterwards or if you want to, if you have a moment to drop in the chat, you can put it in there too. Okay. Um, as you're doing that, I'm going to ask the next question, which is one, I think, and there's more time to talk about some of the technological interventions and some of the pieces you've talked on too. I was really curious, um, how do we, how have you started to think about changing of the consumer behaviors? So you talk a lot about obviously how, uh, Car, car typology preferences have changed and, and some of the challenges around the, uh, the safety issues that come from there. What, what thinking or what uh, answers have you seen to, to those consumer preferences and how we start to shift those with a, with a lens towards safety? Yeah, it's really difficult. It's really difficult. I think there ha just hasn't been very good recognition about the problems with vehicle design. Um, it, you know, when SUVs kind of first came in style in the early 2000s, and then for a period they sort of went out of style, there was actually a lot of backlash, especially from environmentalists. But um, now with crossovers, they're more efficient. Um, the opposition has really died down. There's almost no opposition. And you see a lot of like environmentalists driving SUVs now. Um, so it's really tough. The auto industry spends about $40 billion a year um, advertising and SUVs and pit large pickup trucks are very, very profitable for automakers, especially American automakers, because they're more specialized in trucks and SUVs. Um, like for example, one thing I say in the book is, like you know how I talked about how the RAV4 is basically like a tall Corolla at first. So um, a Corolla and a RAV4, I think that the, the design of the RAV4 has changed a lot, but with crossovers, they're based on a car design. So it, it might not, it, it costs about the same to construct a Corolla as it does to construct a RAV4, but Toyota can charge consumers 10 to 15,000 additional dollars for um, a, a crossover SUV compared to the sedan it's built on. So it's very profitable for them. That's all profit. And um, they make as much as $17,000 in profit on the big pickup trucks like the Silverado. So huge cash cow for the automakers. And they're very invested. Like if you watch a football game, you know, you're just inundated. You'll be inundated the whole time. I can hardly watch TV anymore <laughs> with all these ads for SUVs and pickup trucks. Um, so it's really hard for, I think, like any group, you know, an environmental group, whoever, to sort of um, challenge that. They, they just have so much. Those advertising really works that really influences I believe that really influences how we see the world even though we think we're too smart for that um so it, it's really difficult what, what I sort of think 
the opportunities are more is um, like in the United States, auto safety is regulated by this um, agency called NHTSA. So since the Ralph Nader era, when it was started, 60s and 70s, they're the group that says, okay, now finally, we've drug our feet about this for 20 years, but now finally we're going to require seatbelts. Finally, we're going to require, after a long battle, airbags. Finally, we're going to require anti-lock brakes. But they've never required anything for to protect people outside of vehicles. They've never required anything to protect pedestrians or cyclists. So I think with the, um, the new administration, there's an opportunity. Um, I'm getting a little long-winded. I, <laughs> I don't know if I'm being too long-winded about this, but... That's great. Back in the Obama era, Obama proposed at least they were going to overhaul the vehicle safety rating system. That's the five car rating system you get on cars. Um, there's a really interesting article ab out about it today in Vice. It's very wonky and nerdy, but so Obama proposed for the first time rating vehicles on the pedestrian impacts. So you would actually at least be informed if you're buying a car that's completely deadly for pedestrians. But the Trump administration quashed that. Um, some of the American automakers were against that because their cars are really dangerous for pedestrians. And some of the foreign automakers who do more business in Europe, where they, they care about this stuff more, were supportive. So the Trump administration quashed that. Hopefully the Biden administration will get that going again. So at least people who are buying cars that are really dangerous to pedestrians are at least informed. And there's, a, I think we could go farther. Like I, um, I don't think it's very likely. I don't think we'd have very much success like banning Ford F-250s or maybe even regulating their front end, I think would be difficult political battle and we're not anywhere near that yet. But a lot of new cars come with sensors on the front right now. They come with sensors that will automatically brake if they're about to hit something that's called automatic emergency braking. And some cars come with a technology called automatic pedestrian detection. So before they hit someone, they actually break. And there's some evidence, it's very mixed, but there's some evidence that th that really works. So I would love to see like NHTSA, if you're gonna drive a Ford F-250 that has a 15 foot forward blind zone, you should be required to have pedestrian detection. That's what I'd like to see them do. Um, or we sh or even like city fleets, you know, every every city in the country now, is outfitting their police departments with these big SUVs that have bull bars on the front, you know, those metal bars, which we know are very dangerous to pedestrians. So why are we as taxpayers paying for A, more expensive cars that are more likely to kill people and then paying extra to put these dangerous bars on the front that not only hurt and kill pedestrians, but eliminate the crumple zone in the front of the car so that it, the, the driver and passenger is more likely to be killed. Like, why are we doing that? So there's a lot of low hanging fruit around vehicle safety, but just because it's been sort of ignored or an unsexy issue just hasn't, hasn't gotten the attention it deserves, I don't think. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, thanks. Um, we've had a couple questions and, and you, I think, highlighted on something that's tied to this at the beginning, sort of this, uh, the idea of distracted walkers and, and pedestrians, but also a couple questions about driver behavior and distracted drivers. I'm wondering, and the audience is wondering, sort of, what have you come across in your research and writing about that phenomenon and how, sort of how those personal behaviors play into all of this? And if it's gotten worse over time as we are more smartphone dependent. Yeah, yeah. It's a really good question, and I don't have I don't have a perfect answer to it. I, I do address this in the book. One thing is that um, we don't have very good data about how many drivers are distracted when they hit people, because usually people don't volunteer that information, and usually we don't have like the level of in ex crash investigation that we'd be able to determine that in a lot of cases. Um, so the data about it is really bad. Um, police departments have not updated their reporting forms to really include that, which is not helpful. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to say. One thing, uh, but there are a couple things we can say with a little bit of certainty. And one of them, um, so in other nations, in, other, in, in our peer nations, we have not seen this same phenomenon 
where pedestrian deaths increased 50% over a decade. So, uh, you know, other nations like Canada or uh, the UK, where they do have similar cell phone penetration, have not seen the same phenomenon. So there's nothing about having smartphones that necessarily means you're going to have a lot more pedestrians get killed. Um, but we do know that drivers um, who have smartphones um, are distracted a lot. Almost everyone who drives, according to some pretty um, legit studies, in my opinion, almost everyone who has a smartphone uses it almost every time they drive. Um, and it's very dangerous. We know it's very dangerous. It's as dangerous as drunk driving um, to be distracted that way. So it's a big problem. And we had, again, like to talk about auto safety, the, the cell phone companies, it's like a little bit like, capitalism versus safety on a lot of this stuff. People make a lot of money selling big pickup trucks, so people get killed and we kind of overlook it. Um, same thing a little bit with the cellular communications. We, the, the, we have the technology that would allow us, they can tell, they can sense when you're driving and they could, they could um, prevent you from using your phone, but we haven't required them to do it. So we're sort of tolerating a certain amount of death an injury because, again, lack of political will. Mm, and some really significant, yeah, powerful trade-offs in both directions, right? Powerful, powerful forces in both directions. And we even, let, we even let automakers put very large entertainment systems right in the dash now. Um, like Tesla is one of the worst offenders. Theirs come with video games that I think can be played while the car's in motion. So, mm. um and there are regulators are falling down on the job on a lot of this stuff, I think. And also just that quick pace of the, the changes that are coming from the private sector too, right? I think often of AV uh, technology as well and sort of the ability to keep pace with those changes that car companies will be putting into place as well. It's going to be a, a big question. Is that, did you, I know you look at that in the book as well. Um, how do you how do you fit that conversation around autonomous vehicles in, into this uh, challenge that we're facing? Yeah, one thing that's kind of interesting is I saw for my book, I had an opportunity to talk to some of like the nations and some international top international experts on a lot of this stuff. And I, I was able to talk to some really knowledgeable people about AVs, uh, autonomous vehicles, including like um, one of the top people at Consumer Reports who uh, is an expert on vehicle safety. And a lot of people told me they did not think, they were very skeptical that we would see autonomous vehicles ever, and um, certainly in the next couple decades. So there was a lot of skepticism from the top experts I talked to about reaching full autonomy, about whether reaching full autonomy within a generation was realistic or ever. They are testing. I talk a little bit about sort of the risks with autonomous vehicle testing. It's happening in a number of states, I think more than 20 across the United States right now. And um, there's no regulation or oversight, really. There's only a system of voluntary reporting um, for those companies. And we have already had a person killed um, in Arizona by an autonomous vehicle testing that went really, really wrong. Like I get into a lot of detail about it in my book. And again, it's sort of capitalism, I think, you know, making these trade-offs between these big money-making activities and vulnerable people in that case. But one thing I do say, so that's all kind of a bummer, but one thing I do say in the book is um, I, I think that some of these technologies that I mentioned earlier that are semi-autonomous, like the automatic emergency braking and pedestrian detection, um, that's it's starting to come standard, especially on some vehicles, some new vehicles, especially the luxury models, I think it's very promising. There was this study that I reference in, in the book. Um, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety did a study with Subaru cars that had a package of semi-autonomous features and that it included pedestrian detection and automatic emergency braking. And they found there was a 35% reduction for cars that had that in insurance claims related to pedestrian collisions. So to me, 35%, that seems huge, you know? And um, I know there's a lot of, there's sort of a big disparity in between how those systems perform in different vehicles because they haven't been required by the federal government. There's no rule that 
there's no federal rule that cars have to have automatic emergency braking, which is sort of a disgrace. They should be required. They should be required to have that. And there is a, the auto companies have voluntarily agreed to start including that by 2022, I believe. But the same thing with automatic pedestrian detection, there's no federal requirements. So what I was told um, by some traffic safety experts was that unless there is a federal requirement, we're sort of not able to, um, we're, we're not able to assure the quality of the system. They can sort of call whatever they want, pedestrian detection. Um, so again, our regulators are sort of, there's a lot more we could be doing with um, auto regulation for safety. Yeah, and the, with that precedent of the seatbelts and all the other pieces that you talked about previously, there's obviously ways to do it. So it's really Yeah, like one thing I, I'm, I feel like I'm sort of- No, go ahead, go ahead. But, um, you know, we take, we take seatbelts for granted now, but there was actually a very, people really fought hard. The auto companies fought seatbelts for decades. I think uh, not, not seatbelts, um, but the requirement for seatbelts in all cars. Same thing with airbags. Airbags went all the way, auto, required airbags went all the way to the Supreme Court a few decades ago. So now we take that kind of stuff for granted, but it never comes without a big fight. Um, I, I saw some statistics recently that said, there's this group called Road to Zero that I'm working with a little bit. And they, they issued a report where they said if all cars right now had automatic emergency braking, lane keeping, and I um, can't remember what the other one was. But these are kind of standard technologies that are available now. And they come standard in a lot of luxury cars. They said if that was in all cars, that means we'd have to sort of retrofit old cars to add them, so, which is something... <laughs> We, we never discuss and have never done, but they said we could save about 10,000 lives a year if we did that. And if we were to use, there's other technologies we can use that could be helpful for safety. Like um, if we were to install um, alcohol ignition locks, and that basically is a technology that prevents someone who's drunk from starting their car, we could save another 7,000 lives a year, they said. So they estimate about 17,000 lives, which is um, more than half of our deaths annually. It could be safe just with better vehicle technologies that are already available if they were required. Mm. Uh, that's a great point that there, yeah, there's so many different ways to, so many bites at this apple and some of them are maybe less intractable political fights as you were pointing out earlier. Um, a couple of folks have asked about your observations during COVID around this topic. Um, obviously there was a lot of discussion at the beginning about opening new spaces in cities and, and creating space for pedestrians and bicyclists and others during the lockdowns. Um, what have you noticed about um, folks' behavior and safety on streets? And obviously the lots of equity questions that continue into the where those safer spaces are open. Um, what, have, what have you been thinking about during this and, and how it applies to the work you've done? Yeah, so my book was finished. I finished this book last February, sort of at the beginning of February. So before, before anyone was super concerned that I knew about, about Corona at all. So it was all written free Corona. And then when it happened, I just, um, I, it's one thing I, I will say that there's just a new report out. I'm working with um, a coalition of groups were trying to get um, the Biden administration to commit to a goal of zero traffic deaths by 2050. Um, that you can, if you want to read more about that, the National Safety Council, it's their letter and it's at their site and they're looking for people to sign it. Um, but they just came out with new estimate of traffic deaths in 2020. And there was a big increase. There was an 8% increase in traffic deaths in 2020, even though driving miles declined quite a bit. Driving miles have not declined that much for decades. So for us to, and it was the biggest increase uh, in the death rate, um, the annual death rate, you know, uh, normalized by miles traveled that they've ever seen, they said, in their 96 year history. So we had some really huge failures on traffic safety this year. Um, there was a lot more speeding, apparently, because there was less traffic on the roads. So that one lesson we can take away from that is the importance of speed management. Um, it's interesting because, yeah, I have followed these debates. There are certain cities that got really active about 
um, reapportioning space, um, street space, especially in their downtown areas um, for cafes and restaurants to try and keep the, those restaurants afloat during the pandemic. Other cities like Oakland did some really creative things with play streets and um, and in Cleveland, where I live, they did nothing. <laughs> like our our mayor did nothing. Um, and uh, there was an article recently from the New York Times that looked at a very poor neighborhood in Cleveland and how um, how much it had suffered because of Corona. You know, and it was about a lot about um, you know eviction, hunger, that type of thing. But uh, one of the top complaints, I was surprised how um much it came up was reckless driving about how people were just kind of being terrorized by reckless driving one thing i think that's going on now very clearly is cities are hesitant to enforce traffic laws because of the george floyd protests and the incidents we've seen with um police brutality and police shootings and i think that's totally understandable but i think if we're not going to do enforcement which again, I think makes a lot of sense, um, given what's going on. We have to, we have to, we can't just do nothing. We have to be more proactive about um, some of these traffic calming measures that are self-enforcing instead. Otherwise, you know, ordinary people pay a high price. People lose their children. Um, cars crash into stores. Like, the, you know, this neighborhood in Cleveland, you know, a car crashed into the same store twice, you know, with this reckless driving. So it is a city's, cities, I understand the reluctance to get into enforcement right now, but they can't just do nothing then. They have to be more proactive about controlling speed with design, I think. And similarly, we have lots of those tools, like you talked about on the technological side, there are the engineering, on the engineering and planning side, there are lots of ways to shift and it is expensive, like it's really expensive to rebuild streets, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it, the federal government is not being a good enough partner about providing the kind of resources that are needed for safety at the city level. But like what Detroit's doing um, with speed humps, I think is a good approach. I know they use that in Oakland too. And they have sort of a public process where you're kind of entitled to a speed hump in your neighborhood, as long as a certain percentage of your neighbors sign something saying they want it to. So I think that, you know, that's an example of how it could be approached. Yeah. So for our, our last question, sort of building on some of the points you made about the concentration of the impacts of, of pedestrian deaths and, and uh, crashes in lower income, mostly black or brown communities, we also know that a lot of the historic infrastructure investments, the large scale ones are really disruptive to those same communities and also that there's disinvestment on local sides. I'm wondering, and a few of our, our audience members' questions as well are sort of, have you seen kind of good efforts to use this, this push the, to think about safety for all users and some of the retrofits that you've talked about? Have you seen sort of innovative approaches to also center some of those equity concerns and, and fix either of those large scale or local scale uh, investment challenges and historic challenges? Yeah, again, I, I, I'm going to bring up Oakland. Um, I think that I believe in, and I believe it's Oakland that's trying to use sort of a reparations based model for to t target some of their investment. And not just the safety infrastructure, but also, you know, who's when the question of whose streets get repaired at all, you know, even from potholes. So I think that's the right, <laughs> that's the right sort of approach. And, um, so the neighbor, uh, the na definitely, uh, I think one of the ways we've sort of failed at this, because there's been a lot of attention sort of to walkability in the last 10 years, but we haven't made very much progress on safety. And I think because part of it's because it's been really poorly targeted. It's been gentrifying neighborhoods or wealthy neighborhoods, the, you know, sort of the squeaky wheel that are getting the investment and not the neighborhoods that need it more. So, and I, but I do think, um, Relevant to the question, you do have to be very cautious about um, going into a neighborhood, assuming you have all the answers. I think this is a problem that's very um, localized 
So in some places, the problem might be there aren't the streetlights aren't complete or the sidewalks aren't complete. In some places, it might be um, there's not ADA ramps where they're, where they're needed. The bus, the bus stop infrastructure isn't good enough. Um, so I think it is a really localized issue and it really, you really do need a lot of observation to get it right, but also to be doing a lot of listening and letting neighborhood residents sort of inform what the correct solution is. Yeah, absolutely, and it's as you as you mentioned, those local the local contexts are different, and at at every intersection, right, and that, and the infrastructure that's there. Well, Angie, thank you so much for um, virtually coming to Houston and talking with us all and sharing your work. Um, again, as a reminder, uh, right of way is available uh, across uh, retailers. Um, Angie shared uh, her Island Press uh, information, and obviously, great to uh, support those smaller publishers doing great projects like Angie's. Um, we are really thankful for all of you coming and joining us today. Thanks for your great questions and engagement. Um, as a reminder, we have several other events coming up. Um, we have a Kinder Institute forum series with Richard Florida on March 18th. He'll be talking about his, his observations and ideas about post-COVID cities. So it'll be a really interesting conversation. Um, we have our next Urban Reads on April 14th with Kevin Fitzpatrick and Matthew Spielek, who are discussing their book, Hurricane Harvey's Aftermath, Place, Race, and Inequality in Disaster Recovery. Um, and then, of course, our own Stephen Kleinberg is going to be sharing the findings from the 40th annual Kinder Houston Area Survey at our lunch out, our second annual lunch out in, in COVID times um, on May 11th, where we'll be honoring uh, Bob Urey, the longtime president of Central Houston, you can register for all of those um, events on our website, kinder.rice.edu. Um, and you'll also be able to find recordings of today's event there as well. So thank you all for joining. Angie, thanks again. Um, yeah, thanks for hope, having me. I'm, I'm, hope we can have I'm you again. You guys right. In Texas, we need, we need you guys uh, sort of fighting. So thanks for having me. Thanks, Angie. Take care, everyone.